Here's your host, Alex Garrett. Hey, welcome inside to Alex Garrett Podcasting. It's the 4th of July. Happy birthday, America. Happy Independence Day. And my guest today is one Hilario de Leon. He's actually a Civil War reenactor and a historian at heart. And so let's start there, Hilario. First of all, thanks for joining me. And uh, tell us about your life as a Civil War reenactor and what the 4th of July, Independence Day, means to you. So uh, I do Civil War reenacting uh, as a hobby. I started about, uh, this would be my seventh year doing it. Um, but recently, I've been very busy getting more involved in politics and with uh, my daily work job. Uh, so I haven't had time to go to any reenactments here. Um, but as, so, as as an American, uh, July 4th, Independence Day, it, it, it is so much bigger than just picnics, fireworks, and parades. And, and it, it's a celebration of uh, one of the greatest uh, accomplishments I believe mankind has ever done. The founding fathers paved a way uh, a, a, a way of tr- freedom within an, uh, a world where <laughs> when we look back at Europe, their history being that all their countries are on top of one another. Uh, they've gone through many forms of government and uh, many wars uh, to where just our name itself, we only had to endure one with ourselves. So it's it's truly amazing. It's an accomplishment that sparked many uh, revolutions around the world. Some will argue if you look at France. Well, I heard that, yeah, the French Revolution Haiti. was pretty quickly after us. The French said, "Well, we can do it too, right?" Yes, yes. <laughs> they thought they could do it. They the they didn't just have one revolution. They had a few revolutions, and um, of course, we didn't entirely back them on their first one uh, when they killed uh, our ally, King Louis, uh, who helped us in the, the revolution against the British. But right. uh, it, it's it's such an interesting um, concept, looking back and studying the 245 years of our country's history. We're a ba- we're a baby name. But we've gone through so much in a short amount of time. So, how do the reenactments actually help preserve America? Mm. So, when looking at reenacting, you kind of, people always wonder, oh, did reenacting come from? It's kind of a some people look at it as a weird hobby, but it, it's so much bigger than that. Reenacting actually stems back all the way back to <laughs> the Roman Empire and the Colosseum. They reenacted naval battles uh, for their audience. But in the United States, our first reenactment actually started after the American Revolution, uh, where they did reenactments of the Battle of Yorktown, where the British, of course, surrendered uh, to General Washington and the Continental Army. Uh, You had veterans of the American Revolution who actually served at the Battle of Yorktown, uh, reenacting and participating in these battles demonstrating and teaching people uh, what really happened. So these reenactments are a way to preserve the history for all sides and to show people um, what people, what our ancestors went through in these very trying times uh, that they had to endure and live through. So it it really, uh, it preserves the history. Valerio, tell us some of the roles you played as a Civil War reenactor. So, as a reenactor, one, it's an expensive hobby. Two, there's so much research involved uh, with the amount of just looking at the Civil War. Uh, there, well, there's plenty of timeline eras that people reenact. You have Rome medieval times, uh, Civil War, Revolutionary War, even Vietnam reenactments. World War II reenactments are becoming very popular. So, of course, many of us, uh, people who love history and participate in these events, we we go through (laughs) years of reading books, uh, going to museums, visiting battlefields. The Civil War had over 10,000 
different battlefield engagements that took place on North American soil. So there's a lot of information out there that not even that one reenactor, <laughs> you can ask any of them, there's still information out there that they may not have known or they're still reading about. So it, it takes a lot of time and effort and patience. Um, but one of the roles that I did for, uh, I'd say, uh, a year or two, uh, I portrayed Robert Lincoln, President Lincoln, uh, which was, it, it was amazing to be able to um, reenact as a historical figure. People wouldn't think that uh, one of the president's sons was as uh, well-known or famous as his father, but uh, Robert definitely followed, or he was in the uh, his uh, the shadow of his father's footsteps. He he mm. uh, was very influential on American history and politics, um, and one wouldn't know that unless you actually research um, to, and, and understood that. So that's that's what I would do. And I've traveled the country, and I've got to meet many great people and see many beautiful places uh, that uh, our our American ancestors and uh, founding fathers, influential leaders, were at. Well, give us some insight as to where these influential leaders, like President Lincoln or other American dignitaries, were that we may not know they were. So there's plenty of places that... uh, a lot of uh, let, let's just look at some of our presidents. Um, many places that they've gone to. For example, here in uh, Wisconsin, where I'm from, uh, we had President Grant in Manitowoc. Uh, he was touring the area, and this was kind of around the uh, time that the phone was starting to come out. They asked him, "Opinion, Mr. President, what do you think of this?" And uh, I'm paraphrasing but his words were basically well this is uh a nice thing but i don't see it taking off anytime soon um which boy was he wrong <laughs> <laughs> right um, that's so true even even lincoln even lincoln uh he came up here to wisconsin a few times uh, they say that well i was just in the dells uh, last week at the republican convention we had and they there was a house that they thought that Lincoln might have stayed at uh, in Wisconsin Dells. So I didn't know, but I thought it was an amazing piece of history to contemplate and think about. On that line of going to Republican events means you are a Republican. And do you find that the conservatives, the Republicans, cherish history more than, say, those on the liberal side would? Or do you find many reenactors are liberal in your in, in the battlefield? I know uh, quite a few uh, Democrats and liberals who uh, who are very passionate about history as well. Are they as intense as some of the people that we see in the media or on the news? No, they're not, but uh, they care just as much as about the history, and they, would, too, would like to preserve it. Um, I wish more people uh, within the Democrat Party felt the same way, because history should be taught. Uh, all sides should be taught. There's no sure. reason that we shouldn't know what the other side did. doesn't matter. Union, Confederate, uh, the Allies, the Axis, it doesn't matter. At the end, those time periods, were they're done. We're now in the 21st century, but we can learn from what those people went through, the things that we should model ourselves behind and things that we shouldn't. And... I believe that the Founding Fathers did such an excellent job in creating this republic uh, to have that understanding. Um, but yes, it seems that conservatives and Republicans have always been the ones at the forefront of trying to preserve history, especially mm-hmm. when going through a lot of the legislative votes uh, in Congress. It is a very interesting study for sure. As you're talking about the Congress of then, you know, 245 years ago, July 2nd was actually the vote to become independent from Great Britain. I feel like today's Congress actually wants Americans dependent on them. So would they have voted for independence with this Congress today? Yes, it does seem like that. And and before we get into today's Congress, you have people, 
I think a lot of them don't understand the, the true reasoning behind the Declaration of Independence and why it was uh, uh, written and declared. Um, the, I mean, I did, I did such a, I, I went through and watched an amazing uh, presentation by Hillsdale College, and they, they really spell it out as to the reasoning and fundamental uh, idealism behind our founders. Um, of course, uh, the Declaration of Independence comes in three parts. I mean, it's a universal principles, one. The second part is a bill of particulars, which are like 17 different paragraphs explaining uh, the bad things that King George did um, that would justify their reasoning as to declaring independence and, and making of uh, our country. Um, some of the things that he did, uh, he interfered with the legislator, which violates the first step of all government uh, and, and the meaning of laws or the making of laws. It just, that is something that is clearly spelled out in our declaration uh, that, uh, or in our constitution. So things that were spelled out in our Declaration of Independence really helped the founders many years later eventually set up the Constitution. Um, the king interfered with people's abilities to elect representatives and legislators, uh, which is another key feature within the U.S. Constitution. All these wrongdoings are clearly defined, implied, um, so th that they had tons of reasoning to, as to why they wanted to leave but the rivalry the the colonial representatives and legislators and and the governors that were brought over by king george i mean they were there for a while it's just a matter of time before it happened now when talking about our modern day congress you very much have a point it seems that they want to be under the control of a a, a Outside, and it seems a lot of these people unfortunately sold themselves out to uh, countries like China, uh, which have now major influence uh, over the world uh, in many aspects. Uh, you can just look at uh, different companies, uh, Google. <laughs> uh, see, that's a perfect example. Uh, let's see what's another example. Uh, Nike. I mean, mm -hmm. they use. Uh, much labor the, uh, for ch or child slave labor that uh, people now here look down upon, but we still continue to promote and use Nike. Now, I don't want to get off on a tangent. I want to stay focused on the positivity of the day. Of yeah, ab our absolutely. Celebration of Independence Day. I 100% agree, uh, Hilario de Leon. Now, the rolling up the sleeves aspect of the Declaration of Independence. Let's talk about that for a minute. Independence Day should be a day where we put aside the, the, the party lines of Democrat, Republican, Independent, or whatever your political preference. Put it aside and just be proud to be living in this great republic and calling, calling yourselves Americans. I mean, the United States has done so much, like I mentioned earlier, in its short amount of time. I mean... The fact that we had a uh, civil war over mm. the fundamental uh, idea that all men are created equal and free is amazing. Nowhere else in the world has that happened uh, when you look through history. And to your point, we survived the civil war. Yes, and that, I mean, many many other countries, while our civil war was going, were some of them were kind of interested in seeing the United States fall. Um, others weren't because they knew that we'd eventually be a good ally. Um, but yeah, we survived, uh, and we're still going strong. But some can argue the republic hasn't been this fragile since 1861. Let's hope that that's not true. Tell us why 1861 is an important year to recognize. So 1861, of course, was when the uh, Abraham Lincoln became president, and a, a, a lot of the southern states started to secede, starting with South Carolina. So, of course, we have nowadays uh, states like Texas or California. They're like, we want to secede from the Union. We shouldn't be saying that. We've already fought a war over it. 
other people are in the streets calling for civil war. In 1876, so this was the uh, uh, cent- or bicentennial um, after the war, when the Union was still, uh, or when the United States was still in the midst of con- uh, Reconstruction, Grant was president. Uh, it was Independence Day, July 4th. You didn't have Southerners waving the rebel flag. You, didn't, you had both Union and former Confederate veterans together celebrating under one flag, the United States. And that's a beautiful thing. That is an amazing thing. I, I think that the, like other countries, you can't do that um, after having a war. Uh, sometimes they'll just round you up and or round the traitors up and kill them. But mm. Abraham Lincoln brought the, the South back in as brothers. There are brothers. There are countrymen again. So I think it, it, these different points in um, history on July 4th, a lot of great things have happened. Speaking of great things, you also mentioned to me earlier today before we recorded that this is an important day for Gettysburg. Tell us why. So July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd were the three days of the Battle of Gettysburg. At, by the end of the day today, since we we're recording this today, um, 51,000 Americans would be dead, uh, or there were the casualties from the battle, which is the largest battle ever fought upon North American soil. And then, July 4th, 1863, 158 years ago, the fall of Vicksburg would happen. So because of Gettysburg, when Lee Lee's army was defeated there, and Grant took Vicksburg, the tide of the war changed in the favor of the Union. We not only had access to the Mississippi, um, we also had General Robert E. Lee on the run. So July 4th, we were able to celebrate that victory and also celebrate uh, the continuation of the Republic here in the midst of the Civil War. I imagine you actually enjoy doing these Civil War reenactments. I do enjoy them, and I do miss them. I mean, being that I'm very busy uh, being involved in politics and work, I, I just going to these events, uh, and it didn't help that COVID shot, or shut a lot of these events down and canceled them. Um, but it, it's there's something about it. When you put on the uniform and you go out and you're on the field, and you're reenacting the battle, it just, it takes you out of the 21st century. and It puts you uh, back in the 1800s. You feel like you're kind of really there, and you get to kind of see, I mean, I had an answer who fought in the Civil War at the age of 16, and he served on the Union side. He took up arms, and I like to think that he fought for what he thought was right. Um even though a lot of young lads fought because there was something to do. Um, but I feel like I'm only carrying on his memory and his legacy is serving in the Union, but uh, hundreds and thousands of others uh, who fought. It's, it's truly a, a, an amazing thing uh, to go to these events and do this. It's an honor. Okay, let's talk reenactment artillery are you a musket guy or a cannon guy i gotta know i've i've done them all pretty much uh i've worked on cannons i was usually the guy who pulled the lanyard to make the cannon go boom that was always fun um i did i did uh do infantry for a while so working with the musket and being able to know the bayonet drills that was always fascinating and fun to teach people and show them um, I was a, uh, I do have the rank of captain, uh, at, uh, these events when I portrayed Robert. So I'd switch out my staff officer uniform for infantry one. And I led, uh, guys in fortune and we were able to give orders to charge lines and stuff. So it, it's, I've had a good experience of it all. Even Navy, I was able to do, uh, like Marines, like with some buddies, lead them uh and jumping off the uh one of the long boats uh landing on one of the beaches at the events so I, I i i love them all i heard a little while ago you mentioned the world war ii reenactments 
do they do a reenactment of the storming of Normandy? They do do a, a reenactment of the storming of Normandy. So that was uh, the World War II reenactment, I think, in Ohio. They have I, – I, I, it might have been one of the beaches that they actually practiced for Normandy. I can't remember if that's – I could be wrong. Um, but they, they do do a reenactment of it, and it's pretty cool. You can find it on YouTube. A lot of these reenactments, people can go and look it up on YouTube, just Civil War or World War II reenactment, and you'll find all kinds of hundreds of videos of it. Um, and there are about 3 million reenactors in the U.S. alone that do different time periods. Now, what I'm getting from this conversation is that because you say it's a hobby, you're actually doing this voluntarily. So you're volunteering to be a Civil War reenactor, right? It is all a volunteer hobby, uh, no pay. Uh, usually people, when they get paid, it's for uh, in uh, black powder because black powder can be very expensive, especially when you're working on cannons. So that's like a bounty they get for the event. But there are some historical uh, or like someone portrays a historical figure and they're really good at it, like Lincoln or Grant or uh, Robert E. Lee. Um, they they do get paid, but mostly it's to cover gas um, when going to these events. In your research, but we had great turns out. In your research of the Civil War, in your research of President Abraham Lincoln, did you ever think that senator from Illinois would ever become the president of the United States? It, it always amazes me. Every time I see a picture or a bust or a statue of uh, President Lincoln, uh, he, to think that he came pretty much from nothing <laughs> he worked all his life uh as a on the farm where he lived uh growing up with seven other siblings in a log cabin from kentucky and then moving to illinois and becoming a a, a, a lawyer and then working his way up to eventually become a, a, a senator i mean it just or state senator, I should say. Um, it, it's fascinating. It, it, it kind of shows, like, back then, yeah, a lot of people in Washington City had uh, connections and power and money, especially when they were in office. But someone like Abraham Lincoln, he defied all odds. Did he win all the time? No. Did he have people that were out to get him? <laughs> I mean, that's very evident with uh, just mm -hmm. John Wilkes Booth at the end of his life. Um, but he kept going. He lost uh, sons. He tried to keep a name together from in times of crisis. He was planning to reconstruct it. And we really don't know what kind of president Abraham Lincoln would have been because he's a wartime president. So we don't know what the nation would have looked like after uh the war but i'm sure reconstruction would have gone a lot better yeah. um if he was if he lived and johnson didn't take over but thankfully grant was there to take the helm away from johnson but it it, it, it amazes me and, and abraham lincoln is one of those uh individuals who i look up to who i inspire uh to be like kind to others and um ready for the fight <laughs> the man used to not only wrestle, but he'd also be in competitions of uh, splitting rail rail spots and um, or uh, ugh, I cannot talk. Um, you're fine. You're fine. Yes, doing rail splitting. I mean, the guy was unstoppable uh, in some aspects. All right, now I want to see if I could stump the historian and Civil War reenactor here. Valerio, does July 9th, 1776 sound familiar to you? July 9th, 1776. July 9th, 1776. Hmm. You caught me off guard. Mm. Well, Remind my... me. Refresh my memory. July 9th, 1776 actually was the day George Washington read the Declaration of Independence for the first time in New York to the troops here. And that Liberty Bell that was ringing the day he made that speech is now at the New York Historical Society. Got to check it out if you're in the New York area. Yes, that's right. It was wrong, and he was reading the declaration to the troops, and uh, it, it was very inspiring. I mean, a lot of the funny thing is uh, <laughs> that 
there there was definitely a lot more loyalists. Uh, not everyone really wanted uh, uh, independence, um, and what the founding fathers were doing pretty much high treason against uh, England, uh, and uh, the fact that they did what they did um, was truly it, it's inspirational. It, it's like it will be forever sealed and like like yeah sealed in history as to the day a small group of colonists stood up against a tyrannical government that didn't give them as much representation as they would have liked especially when being taxes them but i'm glad you brought that up and i hope you uh enjoy seeing the, the, that bell i do too take pictures what changed when it comes to militias from then and now so a militia doesn't even have to be like you see militias today. They're usually like 20, 30 people in one group. Uh, some of them are very heavily armed, uh, which they have that right, uh, according to the Second Amendment. But a militia was put in place and, and talked about the Bill of Rights as a, a way they were pretty much the last line of defense before it became well actually anyone can be in the militia back during the revolution it was uh militiamen who fired the well we don't know who fired the first shots but we're at the battle of lexington and concord thus starting the american revolution uh with the first shots and if it wasn't for them starting that or at least carrying it forward where would we be today the United States would be, would we even be here? So the founders knew that over time, because a lot of them didn't agree on the exact idea of government. Oh, sorry, my cat just attacked me. Uh, the idea of which government, did they, did they want a strong central government or did they want a government that was um, not as strong, but enough to protect the rights of the people so what happens if that strong if they went down the route of a really strong federal government um what if that government became tyrannical what if that government had too much power to the point where it started to exert force upon its own citizens see the the government the government meant is to protect the rights that is the basic definition that the founders wanted. We'll have more with Hilaria de Leon on Alex Garib Podcasting after this break. Back here on Alex Garib Podcasting with Civil War reenactor Hilaria de Leon. Uh, did the Founding Fathers want us to storm the Capitol? What are your thoughts on that? Well, the way that they basically, uh, the best way to do that is by getting involved. Run for office. Vote for representatives and legislators who are going to best represent you when they are in those positions of office, whether it's local, state, or federal government. So that's the way the founders wanted Republic to be. They created it that way specifically so we wouldn't have uh, riots, revolutions, and even civil wars going on. Of course, we had our own civil war, um, but that was settled. Um, when the founders created the Articles Confederation, it, it was too weak. The Articles were too weak to the point where they couldn't protect the rights of the people. So what did they do? They created the Constitution. They created a strong, a stronger government that was solely meant to protect the rights of the people and allow its citizens to be self-governed by their fellow citizens. That's that's what makes this country great. That's what makes this country beautiful. And many other countries try to model themselves after them, but it entirely works. So that that is the argument of people can do that I, rather than taking up arms all the time. Valeria, we're also sort of coming out of a post-pandemic restriction-filled year as we're heading into Independence Day. So you mentioned earlier it's the government's role to keep us safe. But did these lockdowns become more than a safety measure and a controlling thing? 
they the lockdown when you have when we've had politicians in office who propose these lockdowns, looking at a lot of these, sorry, Democrat, it was your governors who did this. Uh, a lot of the Democrat governors, Evers, uh, Governor Wick, oh, Wickmore, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom in California, they propose these lockdowns. They cause business to shut down. I lost my job because of the mm-hmm. locked or, or the shutdown. Um, and I suffered because of it. Uh, when they tell you to shut down, but they're out there enjoying the beaches, enjoying going out to restaurants that are supposed to be closed. Look at Nancy Pelosi, mm-hmm. Speaker of the House, going to the hair salon when all the other hair salons were supposed to be closed or shut down because of protecting the right or the 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 lives of people it becomes hypocrisy so it was total power grab personally believe that a lot of them tried to see how far they would go and how much power and control they could get without being called out by state supreme courts or just the supreme court in general uh here in wisconsin our supreme court uh kept uh they kept shooting down uh, the different orders that Governor Evers was trying to propose, um, but they, all of them didn't always work. And it became a point where people became scared of losing their business, scared of their neighbors calling on them. You, you had Americans throughout this time when we should be on a united front because we want to, according to these leaders of ours, save the lives of our fellow citizens. Now we're turning on one another because we have 10 or more people at our house because we miss them and we need that social interaction because we're humans. It, it becomes a point where when is enough enough? There's no need to go rounding people up and <laughs> hang them or, or storming uh, different buildings and removing people from power. But it is, this is a clear example as to why the founders made our country the way it was. The independence they declared from King George, we, didn't, we don't have to do that now. The best – our founders set it up to where we can run against these people and use these as examples as to why they should not be in power and why we need to take back control of our government, our republic, a government of, by, and for the people that protects their individual rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So let's talk about the stimulus check. Does that help pursue life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? Is that a self-reliant thing? Or are they trying to make us dependent on them? this independence? We, we, the amount of money that the federal government is spending on sending out individual stimulus checks, sure, the first few were understandable. I needed one, but I need one because how am I supposed to pay my rent when my governor told my my business or my place that I worked at, which was a rest or a bar as a dishwasher, to shut down. Now I'm hurting. So those were understandable. But now, when we have businesses wide open, wanting people to work. You're just giving people money to stay home so they don't go to work. That becomes really bad. That's that's a way that our one, our prices are skyrocketing because we just we're spending all this money. Our, our dollar it's, it's a way to devalue our dollar, and to, eventually, who knows? Maybe we'll go bankrupt and mm. break the dollar, and that's how our nation would fall, which the founders knew that we shouldn't do that. You know, all I've heard over the last few years is, well, you know, the Roman Empire crumbled. Maybe America's on that track. Are we on that track, Hilario? I don't think we can continue on this track and not fall. If we continue, we are basically, uh, we will be the architects of our own demise. Well, that actually sounds a bit depressing. So sticking with Independence Day now, you mentioned a minute ago about the loyalists to Great Britain even while America declared its independence. When did everyone recognize we were an independent nation? 
there is a good lot. There is a lot of people um, who, uh, like people in New York, people in Boston, people in uh, a lot of these states that were well. I mean, they were colonies, but uh, as John Adams called them, were states. A lot of these states were uh, suffering under that uh, that British boot, uh, where they were the British were showing our force, uh, where these battles happened. A lot of those people were influenced to join. Uh, but I think a lot of people didn't realize it until the war was over. Once England was gone, when we told them to leave, they, <laughs> I think at that point they're like, well, what do we do now? I guess we join you guys, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is not a, which is a, not a good thing at all, especially for today's standards. Back then it was a little different. We weren't as large as a country and we didn't have an already set up government it was something brand new so i think i mean what are you going to do pack up and just go to a place where you've never been a lot of the colonists never even stepped foot out of the colony uh except for ones that were on business uh so i for today i feel there's a lot of people that are starting to wake up that are starting to get pissed off that are getting frustrated people on the left and the right um is it as much as people on the left? Not really. But there's also a good chunk of Americans who don't vote, who don't participate in elections. And some of them, say it's not their fault they, because of the, uh, their lifestyles or ways that they were brought into. Uh, what can uh, – when you, when you see everything that goes on the news or you hear that it's going around in our cities, I mean here in Milwaukee – People are upset. I mean, what could they do to stop this massive crime surge? Mm. Um, people just kind of pack up and leave, or they're stuck there. A lot of people are stuck there. I can't just pack up and leave. I have ties to the, this city. This is my home. I don't mm. want to see it end up like that. Um, but that's why I get involved. Well, I've been to Milwaukee, and I actually love my experience there. That's a conversation for another day. Uh, let's talk about Washington's farewell, because I know that when he decided to step down as president, there were concerns that the republic may not last after he stepped down. Uh, I, be- I mean, a lot of the- I mean, initially when Washington was sworn in, they wanted to make him <laughs> president for life. They, they, they were literally going to trade in King George for <laughs> George Washington. But George Washington didn't want to do it. He didn't want to serve for life. I don't even think he really wanted to be president. But that's another reason why they gave, they had him do it because he was the one who helped lead us, lead our troops through the revolution. Um, and he kind of had that moral compass of like being in the middle, where you had people like John Adams and Thomas Jefferson who were pretty much polar opposite. Uh, once he left the office, Adams took over, and it was a completely different uh, presidency where he had uh, issues with the press and issues with his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson, who took over after him, uh, thus causing them to be divided and not talk to one another for many, many, many years until the last few uh, years of their life, uh, which, as a matter of fact, they did, they did both passed away on July 4th, on wow. Independence Day. Just a few, uh, I believe, a few hours after one another. It's, almost, it's very symbolic. They, mm. they were there at the founding, and they died on the same day as when we declared our independence. It just, it, I think that's very symbolic. Hell, even even uh, Calvin Coolidge had a his birthday was on July fourth. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's these little facts that make American history so amazing and unique from many other countries. But it's good thing that after Washington, that our country didn't <laughs> fall and collapse. Of course, when he was president, there was the whiskey riots because Congress needed to put. Or not, or really, yeah, Congress basically needed to put a tax on. Uh, we needed taxes to pay off our debt, and what was one of the things that uh, could be taxed? Whiskey, and of course there was a revolt. 
which Washington put on his uniform, rode out himself, and put it down because uh, a lot of them were veterans of the Revolution and respected Washington. So the revolt, or revolts were there, but we survived. And I think today we can continue to survive what's this dark shadow and cloud that hangs in that makes a lot of people feel uneasy and very worried for the future. It will in time go away. We've been through worse. One of those dark clouds, I was just going to say, as you were saying that, was the Great Depression, and yet we came out of the Great Depression. We, during the Great Depression, we weren't the only country that was suffering. Many other countries around the world were suffering. And for example, Germany, of course, they were suffering after the Great War and having to pay off their debt uh, through uh, the many different allies for uh, they kind of took the blame for it, even though Austria started it. Um, they, they were also suffering even more because of that debt, and then the Great Depression hit. So now we're, we're the ones who are in competition with a lot of our different allies. A lot of them take advantage of us, whether it's spending on, uh, on defense, spending on... Uh, NATO. NATO is a perfect example. These trade deals, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that we were pulled out of, but now they're looking to bring us in, or the, the Paris Climate Accord. Right, that My too. Bad. Um, so these different things, um, we weren't really competing because we were all suffering together. But now you have countries like China and Russia that are active since <laughs> since the 50s actively trying to uh, get ahead or get advantage over us, which a lot of times they do on certain issues, but most times we've been able to keep them at bay. Uh, so that's why it seems more dire that we get out of this hole that we're doing ourselves and we stop this crazy spending. We get back to uh, our roots of standing up for the rights of the people and not targeting certain groups of people because of their political affiliation or because their business is open and they need to make money and not lose everything because that's all they have. Doesn't the destruction of statues also add to the angst of that dark cloud you're mentioning? In watching all this destruction, I notice a lot of comparisons to Nazi Germany, right? It is exactly what they did in Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany... Uh, well, even when the, the, the Third Reich was falling and Berlin was on fire, the Nazis were still out there burning things that they were doing. There's a lot of stuff that we don't – a lot of information we don't have about the Nazis because they spent uh, days burning it before the Allies could even get to uh, these locations. But when you – the country tears down its own history it leads it to fail because it has no way to understand where it came from what it's gone through and ways that it can move forward our country many times the people on the left they argue oh we have systemic racism within our country because we've had our country had that unfortunately original sin in a way they argue of slavery but forget that the founder debated the very issue of slavery at the art or at the um the constitutional convention uh alexander alexander who is a renowned abolitionist hated slavery he didn't even bring it up because he knew it was one of the issues you could not bring up because we already talked about it and a lot of the southern states threatened to not join the united states I also know that Washington bit his tongue about slavery because he didn't want to cause divide to the Republic. Yet in his will, he did ask the remaining slaves to be freed on his estate. Yes, he did. And a lot of people forget about that. Uh, but yes, the founders brought the issue up at the very first meeting. The whole idea that all men are created equal that is what they stressed upon. Even Thomas Jefferson, who had many slaves, uh, he uh, later on in his life, he hated the idea of slavery. He wanted to get rid of it. But if we brought it up and we pushed it forward, 
we wouldn't be the United States uh, in the beginning years. I don't know what our country would look like. Maybe we would eventually join. But the founders made it to where the Constitution was left open to be amended uh, so that, one, they knew slavery was going to die out eventually um, with the fact that the way the Constitution was worded and along with the Declaration of Independence years prior, um, there's no reason why uh, a majority of the country would stand for it many years down the road. Um, or they thought that it would uh, die out naturally. That, or that was the natural point. Or it would have to be taken out legislatively. That's why they left it open to be amended. Little did they know that it would lead us to a war against ourselves. Um, and it also it, it was both war and legislatively um, with the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, the 14th, 15th Amendments. While we're on the subjects of amendments, is the Constitution alive and breathing still? Is that argument valid? Today's amendments probably would be really bad, um, being that they'd try to – they'll probably – if Congress today were to start putting amendments into the Constitution, uh, they would try to cancel probably out other amendments they could. Right. Uh, this is why the left tried to push to stack the court and to bring states like, or, or states into the union uh, and make Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico and many other territories, states, so that they would have more legislative power in Congress that would uh, – no one could stop them with uh, the bills, the amendments, and stuff that they would propose. And, and the Constitution is just a piece of paper that spells out our laws that have our, – our, our, natural, our natural laws and r- natural rights that have been there since – these ideas, these uh, of natural rights, have been around for years, especially in the the colonies. Uh, in, around 1710 uh, is kind of when the idea of uh, natural rights, um, natural liberty, uh, that morals, they've been there. Um, and a lot of the state constitutions, they spelled it out very uh, seldomly. Or, or very uh, specifically, uh, let's see. I had here uh, the 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 um, where was it? It was the Virginia, the Virginia uh, Declaration of Rights that government ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community. And that was in 1776. So the, they're they're then. Amending stuff would be disastrous for our our nation. All right, Hilario, as you are a Civil War reenactor, are we in any kind of Civil War right now? Or this independence say, can we be assured that while it may not look it, we still are a united front? Now, this is something that uh, my friend Ed Delgado, your friend as well, we've talked about many times. Uh, would it be a civil war like it was in the 1860s? No, no, it would not. Warfare one has completely changed. But are we at that point where people are ready to take up arms against one another? I don't know. I don't know if people really have the the, the guts to pull up, lift up that weapon and shoot your fellow uh, countrymen. But there are a lot of people that are. But I don't think it'd be that kind of civil war. We are right now engaged in a cultural civil war uh similar to what the north and the south went through uh since the beginning of the nation uh from free states to slave states um that culture has now translated over to uh political parties republicans versus democrats conservatives versus liberals uh uh what's what is it uh, capitalism versus communism i mean these are very cultural and political issue. I think we're engaged in that fight right now, uh, looking at examples of critical race theory. There's so many things that we're fighting on right now. It's like a, it's like a night and day sometimes. Uh, and a lot of these things, they won't go away for a while. They'll probably be with us for quite a few years. 
the right is getting pissed off enough to where its movement has grown in a manner of four years. Look at the election of 2020 uh, compared to 2016 when President Trump, when he was a candidate, only got 65 million votes or 64 million votes to now 2020 where he gained 12 million new voters uh, onto that already 64. So people have been getting pissed off for years, not just on the left, but on the right, as I said earlier. Uh, the matter, or the issue is like we won't really see it. I think we see it play out when it comes election time. But that's just my opinion. I could be completely wrong. Well, we'll have to see what happens in 2022 and beyond. Uh, but where can people follow your work as a Civil War reenactor? Hilario De Leon. So people can find me on social media, on Facebook, Hilario De Leon, or my Instagram. Uh, just type in Hilario De Leon 12, I believe is my username. Um, I'm more active on those two social media platforms. Um, but if you want to go see reenactments and stuff, if you're in the Wisconsin area, uh, I sometimes do the Menominee Falls one or the one at uh, Wade House in Greenbush, Wisconsin. But uh, there's a lot, there's reenactments uh, all around the country. You just got to look them up online, see where the closest one is, and just go, give it a try, see see what it's about, see what you'll learn. Uh, who knows? Maybe you'll be in, or interested enough to actually become a reenactor. It's really expensive, mind you, but. <laughs> Yeah, I I think it's worth it to part or like indulge yourself and bring yourself into that uh, that hobby to even as just a spectator. So those are ways places you can find me. Well, the fireworks are literally going off around the house, so I guess that means we're heading into the Fourth of July the right way. Hilario De Leon, thanks so much for joining me this Independence Day, 2021. Thank you for having me, Alex. Uh, John Adams said the 4th of July should be celebrated with fireworks, picnics, and uh, parades. So everyone enjoy your Independence Day tomorrow. Shoot off a bunch of fireworks, and uh, let's have a great time. Let's have another 245 years. Amen to that. I'm Alex Garrett. Happy Independence Day. Please celebrate responsibly, and we'll catch you next time on Alex Garrett Podcasting.